Okay, excellent. Um, welcome everyone to this Institution of Environmental Sciences webinar, guiding the restoration of our estuaries and coasts. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Ben Green, an estuarine and coastal specialist at the Environment Agency. And Ben's gonna be talking about the three new UK and Ireland handbooks on the restoration of salt marsh, seagrass and intertidal habitats. After the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. So please do submit these on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation. And I will then ask these on your behalf later on. Just to let you know that this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel um, our, our next week or so. Um, and the link will be available on our website as well. Thank you very much for logging in. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, and thank you to Ben. I'll now hand over to you. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, today I'm talking to you about our new restoration handbooks. Uh, so I'm yeah, Ben Green. I uh, a senior advisor in the Estuaries and Coast Planning team at the Environment Agency. I uh, also need to acknowledge um, uh, many other partners we've had in developing these handbooks as well from uh, across government agencies, um, NGOs such as ZSL, University of Portsmouth, con uh, consultancies at ABP Mayor as well. So, um, uh, and yeah, the various editors and partners are all in, at bottom, in the bottom there. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I've been at the Environment Agency now for about 10 years. Um, my originally started there in the marine monitoring um, side of the agency. You might you may or may not be aware that uh, we actually do quite a lot of marine monitoring in the Environment Agency. We have a fleet of five coastal survey vessels that uh, go around the, around the coast of England, uh, taking all range of uh, marine monitoring samples, um, and which we use for uh, informing our management decisions um, in our water bodies around the coast. Um, I also used to work in uh, some marine protected areas in uh, succumbent to natural England as well. And uh, now I focus on, well, in my current role, I focus on restoration work. Uh, I'm project manager of the Rememory Initiative, which we'll talk about in a minute, and we'll do a, a, a more kind of national based uh, estuarine and coastal uh, strategic issues. Uh, so, oh, there we go. Um, so, I'm here today to talk to you about our new blue carbon restoration handbooks for restoring salt marsh, uh, seagrass and estuarine and coastal habitats uh, using dredge sediment. Uh, these were all launched at COP26 in last November, and they actually partner with uh, the one at the handbook on the left, uh, the Native Oyster Restoration Handbook that was launched in November 2020. Um, if you can't scan those QR codes now, uh, they're actually all available to download on the catchment-based approach uh, website. Um, so the link's at the bottom there, or if you just Google uh, CABA and Restoration Handbooks, it's the first thing that pops up. Um, these handbooks were jointly funded by uh, DEFRA and the Environment Agency, and they were published as part of this uh, Restoring Meadows, Marsh and Reef or Rememory initiative. And Rememory is a cross DEFRA initiative and it's led by the Environment Agency and its uh, the aim is to support the restoration of our key estuarine and coastal habitats such as salt marsh, such as seagrass, uh, such as native oyster reefs. Um, we've got a steering group, which is composed of representatives from some of the key DEFRA agencies uh, that you see at the bottom there, um, and some of the other government bodies. And we've also got a partnership group, which is composed of a range of environmental NGOs uh, driving forward an estuarine and coastal restoration across the United Kingdom. So our initiative has a mission to restore through habitat creation as 15% uh, of our current extent of key estuarine and coastal habitats by 2043. And that is the end of the DEFRA 25 year environment plan. Um, so, for example, for salt marshes, uh, it's looking at creating about 55 uh, square kilometres of new habitat in England, whether that be through mandatory alignments or creating new intertidal habitat with dredge material. So our mission is kind of, it's centred on delivering practical restoration by working with natural processes. Um, and we're aiming to provide kind of a national sort of kind of strategic direction and very much in encouraging supporting like local ownership, local delivery of these projects. And we, we, our initiative kind of encompasses is sharing knowledge and we look to provide tools and guidance, uh, looking at regulatory streamlining for facilitating more restoration projects. Uh, and it, it's all designed around basically around achieving more practical restoration on the ground. 
So as I said, um, the initiative aims to restore particularly the habitats where we've lost significant extent over the last few centuries. So for salt marsh, we've lost about 85% of our salt marsh in England since the mid 1800s. Uh, we've lost seagrass in approximately 50% of the estuaries and coastal areas where it once was. And we've lost 95%, uh, probably approaching 99% now, in fact, of our native oyster reefs in England. And these are, uh, these are habitats that really can't recover on their own without some sort of active intervention. So if we can restore those through uh, mandatory alignments or regulated tidal exchanges for salt marsh or replanting seagrass beds, reseeding oyster beds, we can hopefully also recover some of those key ecosystem services that these habitats provide, whether that be flood defence potential, whether it be improving our water quality, enhancing our biodiversity, or the one that we're probably looking in a bit more detail today is, is uh, potential for carbon sequestration through blue carbon. So, um, so there's quite a lot that gets uh, uh, talked about about blue carbon at the moment. And uh, in case you're not aware, um, blue carbon, uh, blue carbon habitats are habitats that can capture carbon dioxide from, uh, as organic carbon, store it in their biomass, uh, or storing it in surrounding sediments, so marine and coastal habitats. And recent estimates can show that uh, blue carbon habitats probably store about 2% of the UK's emissions. And that's through with either salt marshes, intertidal mudflats, seagrass beds, uh, and subtidal muds and, and, and potentially kelp as well. Uh, so these habitats can sequester carbon by removing it from the atmosphere. They can store it in a sediment or in a, in a vegetation. And potentially they can also release it again as well. With, and that's whether these habitats can be damaged, whether that could be through um, disturbance activities, uh, such as potentially fishing or activities or sediment disturbance, where these habitats can uh, are lost. It'd be things like through erosion of salt marshes or just a general loss of uh, seagrass habitats that we've seen over the last uh, 100 years or so. And that can release the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, which obviously is a bad thing. So we hear a lot about blue carbon habitats and how do they generally compare? Are they as good as we hear? Um, there's some bits of recent really interesting uh, evidence that's come out of Steert, which is a, a newly created salt marsh habitat in Somerset. Um, and but when you when you look at um, the, uh, the carbon flux of uh, the sequestration rates of these different habitats, and this is uh, from some recently published reports by Natural England by CFAS. So I'm just going to collect these all together myself. I made this uh, graph myself. Um, you can tell us that in the UK that salt marsh is probably the best blue carbon habitat we have uh, at sequestering carbon. It's a bit better than seagrass, which, which itself is a bit better than mudflats, all of which are probably not as actually good as the, probably the best blue carbon habitat out there, which is mangroves, although obviously we don't have any of those around here. Um, and when you but maybe they're not quite as good as some of our, uh, of our woodland habitats, uh, although there's quite a lot of variation in those error bars. Um, and all of the habitats, whether it be blue carbon or whether it be woodland habitats, are better than uh, sequestering carbon than arable land, intensive grassland, which barely does anything, and far better than degraded peat habitats, which obviously emit large amounts of carbon dioxide. <laughs> However, we're, uh, whilst blue carbon habitats may not be good as sequestering uh, carbon as woodlands potentially, you do have to look at all the other ecosystem benefits they provide. It is, it is the enhanced water quality, it is the enhanced biodiversity. This is for salt marshes, this picture here is an example from our salt marsh handbook of the different ecosystem services they provide. The flood and coastal defence one is really a, a key. And, uh, and they also do other things such as enhance fisheries by species such as sea bass that use salt marshes as nursery sites. So you need to have a look at the all encompassing uh, ecosystem services that these habitats can provide to look at their total real benefits. One thing I will just go talk a little bit more about blue carbon habitats in them is actually we see these figures of salt marsh can sequester this or seagrass can sequester this, but actually our evidence base for these figures is not necessarily particularly good. Um, salt marsh has quite a large variability of rates. The figures that we use for seagrass in the UK is actually only based off a single data point for, for seagrass, uh, for carbon sequestration of seagrass, and it's not even from the UK. <laughs> so um, the, we uh, need to do an awful lot of work to improve our evidence base uh, for blue carbon habitats. Um, 
uh, in the UK. And there is there are schemes and there are initiatives in place at the moment that are actually going to start improving this over the next few years. So various funded projects and uh, that that are in that are underway now so hopefully these will these graphs will uh, improve and get smaller error bars over time but you just need to be cautious about using some of these single figures um just because there is obviously going to be a lot of natural variability and it's maybe going a little bit off, off topic but we do we're salt marsh carbon we, we know that salt marsh can store about uh 403 tons of carbon per hectare can sequester almost uh, six tons per hectare from the figures that, uh from those references that I, I used in that graph earlier but how does that vary across things like zonation there's different salt marsh zones how does it restore uh, vary between a, a natural or restored marsh or between this, the underlying sediment you get in these marshes so this we get sandy sediments and marshes in places like Norfolk, north of the coast or muddy marshes in places like Essex which will sequester uh, and store huge well a huge amounts of variation in, in between these different types of habitat um, but yet we just say for salt marshes all of the same for blue car for blue carbon habitats and that oh so this is just to give you an example of the different types of zonation we have this is the ribble estuary in uh in lancashire and just to yeah give you an example of the different types of salt marsh zones you can get each one of those might have different carp storage and sequestration potentials for carbon and there's a similar issue for seagrass as well. So we have seagrass is a seagrass bed is anything between five and 100% cover of seagrass. And obviously with that big variation, you can get a lot in, in density, you can get, a, you could potentially get a large variation in car blue carbon, but we don't know that. We don't know how it varies between intertidal and subtidal beds or between the different species of seagrass we get in the UK, Zostra nautii and Zostra mariner. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, uh, evidence we need to gather to basically understand blue carbon uh, habitats a lot more and then potentially how we can um, utilize those habitats and attract potential uh, financing to, to restore more of those habitats. However, in the meantime, just because we don't have the evidence there, it shouldn't preclude us from actually trying to undertake restoration work now. So it shouldn't be stopping us from starting that restoration process. And that's where I, where the kind of rememory initiative uh, has has come in, uh, uh, has started really. So we have uh, so well, one of our objectives, sorry, of the rememory initiative, is to provide tools and guidance for stakeholders who are looking to undertake such restoration projects. So I'll talk about, about the restoration handbooks in a minute. But one of the, uh, we wanted to provide tools and guidance to, be, just to show people where they can restore and, also, uh, uh, and how they can restore. So the handbooks fall into that how I can restore category. But for the where I can restore category, we have published recently some restoration potential maps. And we will be shortly publishing historic oyster maps as well that show where oysters used to be. But uh, our restoration potential maps uh, are um, kind of quite we think are quite important that, and they indicate parts of the coastline where creating new seagrass, salt marsh, native oyster habitats could be successful. And the aim of this is kind of a, to encourage those first local discussions on restoration. Um, and it was these were originally created for the, the river basin management planning process and to kind of encourage more projects and partnerships. And they are admittedly at quite a course level. Um, and we would always encourage, if you are going to just, we would encourage these just to identify the initial areas and then definitely undertake further, more fine scale modeling uh, when you actually want to put your, do undertake your project on the ground. Uh, these are also all available on the CABA Coastal Data Explorer web portal, which holds a whole range of, uh, uh, of various data products and um, yeah, can be viewed and downloaded from there. So the restoration potential maps, as I said, kind of give you the, uh, the, guy, the information on where to restore. Um, and it was a re the restoration handbooks uh, were, were identified to provide the information on how to restore. And the reason we created these handbooks is that when we set out, there was actually no UK wide guidance for restoration of, of most of these habitats. Um, and this was seen as a bit of a barrier. Uh, it was seen as a barrier to groups who were wanting to undertake such restoration, but it was also causing regulatory uncertainty um, to licensing and permitting authorities, as there was you know, a range of approaches and standards. 
So we wanted to aim, make sure these handbooks were aimed at a whole range of stakeholders who uh, might, might want to undertake estuarine and coastal uh, habitat creation products, whether it be from community groups and coastal partnerships wanting to undertake small scale projects, or to ENGOs, industry, um, uh, undertaking larger projects, and, uh, and specifically for the dredge sediment handbook, uh, we were particularly looking at supporting the port sector who undertake uh, dredging work in, in their, obviously in the ports and harbours. We want all the handbooks to be living documents. Okay? So we don't want to just publish them and leave them. We want to uh, update them periodically when new science appears. And a lot of these restoration initiatives and uh, are very much in their pioneering stages. And we really want to, as our understanding and our knowledge improves, we want to go back and update those handbooks every few years just to try and make sure that we are really um, uh, highlighting the most recent uh, best practice that's available. So the aims of the handbooks were to really to kind of capture the knowledge and expertise of the top national international restoration practitioners in, in, in their subject area. Um, so we and to kind of lead to agreement of guidance across the Australian and coastal restoration and blue carbon community. Um, we wanted the handbooks also to be applicable across the UK. Um, so and also uh, to other states in the Northeast Atlantic where these habitats are similarly degraded um, to try and kind of showcase uh, the expertise that we have in restoration in this country in an international, inter international level. And uh, ideally, ultimately, it is to you know, deliver uh, further restoration and enhancement of blue carbon habitats across the UK and Ireland as well. These habitats were, you know, um, these habitats and were, are, and our collaborators were from across the UK and Ireland. So this side, <laughs> it's not you know, it's just basically to reinforce that it was a UK and Ireland wide uh, effort, even though these handbooks uh, we were kind of have environment agency on it. We had steering groups that were made up of representatives from uh, all four uh, UK nations. So uh, from, from the statutory nature conservation bodies and representative from the uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service in the Republic of Ireland. And we all worked together to kind of coordinate the structure and the content of these handbooks uh, and worked with the, with the authors and the, the editors of these handbooks to make sure that it, the final outputs delivered what we, we thought was needed for conservation uh, in, the, uh, in each one of these countries. So let's have a look at uh, these uh, habitats in a little bit more detail. So uh, first thing at the Salt Marsh Restoration Handbook, um, unlike the other handbooks, there is actually already some guidance for creating new salt marsh habitats through mandatory alignments or regulated tidal exchanges. However, these are rapidly approaching uh, 15 years or old or more uh, since they were originally updated. Oh, since they were originally created. Um, and since they were published, we've actually had significant developments in salt marsh restoration uh, in England, and in fact, uh, and across the UK. Uh, and the, these original handbooks here, they, do, they don't take into account some of these new fantastic case studies, uh, as fantastic sites we've got in places like Med Mary, or Steert, or Alcabra Flats. Um, and we wanted to make sure we included these uh, case studies into the new handbook. I should also flag as well here, there's actually some other guidance as well that kind of partners quite well with our Salmosh Handbook um, from the United States, the Environment Agency we also worked on around natural flood management and nature-based solutions, which I can point, if someone, if anyone is interested in that as well, I can point people in the direction of that uh, um, uh, set after this call. So Saltmarsh Handbook is split into five chapters. It's got an introduction that specifically covers looking at blue carbon and the other ecosystem services that salt marshes provide. We've got a chapter on uh, getting started, um, looking at site selection, looking at opportunities of funding, um, a chapter on legislation covering specific uh, UK nations and Ireland uh, planning and licensing processes, so tailored to each individual country. Um, uh, and the, yeah, the planning and licensing you need to do to undertake a realignment because it is quite a complex pro process. And um, we've got a chapter on communications and engagement uh, with stakeholders um, before, during, and after the restoration process, particularly focused on public consultations because that is, um, that is quite key for, for salt marsh restoration. Um, and then 
a final chapter on the different approaches uh, to salt marsh restoration, taking account of the aims of your restoration project. Um, so this handbook was really led by the Environment Agency, and we had a huge range of contributors from across academia, from industry, uh, from ENGOs. I think we've had 30 different authors contribute to this handbook, so it's a fantastic uh, collaborative effort, really. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it would be a really, really pleased with the outcomes. Um, we wanted to make sure we, can, we had case studies from uh, many of these, or this, and this map on the right here has all the different restoration projects that have gone uh, take place for some marsh across the UK. We want to make sure we had as many of those case studies included in the handbook as possible. And oh, I've got to say as well, there is an appendix as well as to separate to the handbook that you can download, which uh, provides information on um, pre and post restoration monitoring strategies for uh, salt marsh restoration projects as well, which are useful for that you might, yeah, may be needed. So this just gives you an example of what the handbooks are looking like inside. They've all, all four handbooks got the same templates and we wanted to make sure that they were easily accessible uh, uh, and easily readable for, um, for any in particular, any stakeholders who are involved. Um, and yeah, looking at the legislation, the uh, communications and the in practice uh, chapters from left to right respectively. So looking at the seagrass restoration handbook, um, the structure of the seagrass restoration handbook is broadly similar to the salt marsh handbook. It covers an introduction uh, with a focus on blue carbon, um, a, a section on getting started and um, permitting and licensing as well, and a chapter on replanting and reseeding approaches and a chapter on monitoring. Um, however, when we, that's all, that was, that was our, uh, aims, but when we first kind of set up for the seagrass handbook, there was the only resource that was actually available across Northwest Europe was kind of, uh, a, a Swedish uh, seagrass restoration handbook, which has actually recently been translated by Nature Scott, and it's now so it's now in, in English um, and available from uh, Nature Scott. And our, the, we wanted the seagrass handbook really to bring together the knowledge and expertise of some of the current projects that are going on around, around the UK. We've got Project Seagrass and the University of Swansea who are doing fantastic restoration in Wales and starting new restoration projects in England and Scotland as well. Um, we've got the, the Life Remedies Project uh, managed by Natural England, which is looking at seagrass restoration in Plymouth and in the Solent. Um, so we wanted to encompass all of those pioneering projects. There's a range of different approaches to seagrass restoration, whether it be replanting seeds or replanting plants directly, intertidally and subtidally. And we wanted to make sure that we covered all of that and also made the handbook applicable to uh, anyone who was wanting to undertake restoration of Zostra um, across its natural biogeographic range. Zostra you get across the United States and Asia as well, Zostra mariner. Um, so potentially this handbook could be used for restoration in any of the, uh, yeah, anywhere across its range. Um, so yeah, I've already mentioned the structure of the handbook uh, um, what, and what uh, the, the, the contents are. Um, and yeah, some examples of what, uh, of what it looks like, and uh, particularly the, the, the chapter three here, looking at all the different methods you can use for undertaking uh, seagrass restoration, trying to uh, sort of to help you identify what methods could be the best way forward for, for your particular project. Um, the public engagement chapter, I think, is particularly key. Uh, seagrass restoration, in particular, require uh, relies quite heavily on volunteers. And I think uh, the public can get some of the examples of public engagement and communications in some of the projects that are taking place in the UK to, to date are really amazing. Um, to some of the work that we're engaging with schools and uh, and uh, local lo and local partnerships are really, really fantastic. And I think it was great we managed to uh, highlight those in that chapter. Um, and looking at the third handbook now, the Restoring Intertidal Habitats with Dredge Material. Um, this is a bit of a, a different handbook to the, the other two. And um, well, I so saw that this map on the right here, uh, each one of those points on that map is a disposal site for dredge sediment uh, uh, across uh, England. Um, there, are, there are many of them. Um, and these are this is sediment that's been dredged for navigation dredging in ports and harbors. And uh, across all these sites, it's about 17 million meter cubed worth of sediment is disposed in these sites at sea each year. And from all that 17 million meter cubed, 0.4% is, is used for restoration in some way or another. 
so sorry excuse me so um there is a huge potential uh for utilizing dredge sediment for for restoring habitats and for uh enhancing a, and developing a more sustainable uh, uh sediment resource um, that we can use uh, within for, for for dredging um However, it's, when it comes to blue carbon, it's maybe a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, the dredging process will release carbon from sediments, but then taking that material and depositing it uh, on in intertidal habitats uh, can then actually enhance blue carbon by actually restoring these blue carbon habitats. So you take dredge material, deposit it in, the, in mud flats, and then you can create potentially create new salt marshes as a result that uh, can yeah, obviously improve our blue carbon stocks. Um, in case you're not, if you're not aware of the process, uh, you have maintenance dredging, which, uh, which uses excavators and hoppers uh, to take um, sediment from, uh, from, uh, from an estuary or from a harbour or a port. Uh, and then we can actually recharge it and deposit it back on the, uh, in the intertidal mudflats or intertidal areas using rigs like this, which can be used to pump it back into, uh, into the position to, in, to elevate uh, the mudflats and, and uh, create new habitats. So they can, uh, the material can be deposited back on either through directly depositing it through grabbing, or you can hydraulically pump uh, sediment back from, from a dredge site or dredge, uh, uh, dredge vessel uh, onto the marshes. And this is an example from uh, Limington in the Solent. Uh, and this is a probe where the yeah, uh, dredge sediment is piped directly onto uh, an intertidal mudflat. And you can see from where it was originally uh, deposited um, over the space on is the set of images on the right here, over the space of maybe uh, six or eight years. Um, the, the, once the sediment was deposited, there's actually been an, a, a, a colonization and a growth of pioneer salt marsh slowly turning into uh, low salt marsh um, over, over that period. So the process uh, can, can really have uh, yeah, benefits to, your, to our blue carbon habitats. Um, so uh, the chapter, the, the handbook itself, um, is developed by uh, the uh, the beneficial use working group, which is a cross DEFRA and NGO group looking at looking at this in how, in improving this process and uh, using this process more in restoration and working with CFAS and consultancy ABP Mayor. And it's a, got a chapter on an introductory chapter to using dredge sediment, looking at the methods in chapter two, a third chapter looking at the regulatory processes around it, particularly is a little bit different to some of the other handbooks. So obviously you have to look at the chemical contaminant contents in your sediment. And then a fourth chapter looking at recommendations going forward. Um, finally, I wanted to mention our Native Oyster Handbook. Um, it was published in November 2020, and it's not technically, Native Oysters aren't technically a blue carbon habitat, as they, they do very well, they do some of the minimal sequestration benefits potentially from what we understand. Um, <clears throat> again, it's available as we work with the UK Native Oyster Network. It's a key habitat to restore though, because it does have many other benefits and ecosystem services, not necessarily carbon, but water quality, biodiversity benefits as well. Um, it's available also on the CABA website and on the Native Oyster Network website. And since we published that handbook, uh, the Native Oyster Network also published a biosecurity and a monitoring handbook specifically for UK, uh, for European native oyster restoration. So I'd yeah, very much encourage you to yeah, read those as well if you're interested in undertaking that sort of restoration work. Um, we've also got a set of infographics as well um, that we designed for these handbooks. Um, they're available to download for free and to be utilized um, uh, how, you, how you want, but our, from our Rememory website, we've got high res uh, versions of all these infographics available to, on, on our Rememory website. Uh, if you just Google, um, it's, it's part of the Estrella and Coastal Sciences Association website. So if you just Google EXA and Rememory, it should be the first thing that pops up. So where are we going from, from now? So we've created these handbooks. What is next? We're, so we're looking for new opportunities of, opportunities for restoration and there's quite a lot to, uh, to potentially coming over the next few years uh, few years we've got uh, for intertidal restoration we have elements of the new environmental land management uh, uh well the landscape recovery scheme um, of environmental land management and biodiversity net gain that both offer opportunities for potentially intertidal restoration uh, and pilots for those are beginning to start now 
Um, the Environment Agency's Habitat, Habitat Compensation Program uh, is continuing, and that's a program that kind of looks to restore salt marsh habitats where they've been lost due to our flood defences, and we'll be looking for new sites, carrying on to re restoring um, habitats and more managed realignments over the next 25 years or so. In the river basin management planning process, which is going on at the moment, we've uh, the environment is keen to introduce, or we have introduced, a measure for local estuary and coastal restoration action plans. And we're very much hoping these are going to be taken up and developing new uh, action plans for restoration uh, at local stakeholder level as well. And in terms of what's next for the handbooks, um, we're obviously very keen to try and promote them and to deliver restoration more uh, blue carbon handbook, blue carbon habitat. Sorry. Um, we want to make sure that they, these ha handbooks are very much involved in the, uh, and working with stakeholders who are, who are going to be developing projects for net gain and landscape recovery and local nature recovery strategies, and also for the potential to achieve net zero as well. We want to use to, fac to facilitate the regulatory and licensing processes. And ideally, uh, that last point is we want we've very, these handbooks very much been looking at individual habitats. Um, we really want to look at actually looking at a seascape restoration approach, and actually always looking to use all these handbooks together to encourage not just salt marsh restoration, not just seagrass restoration, but a, a combined uh, sea, seascape approach for holistic um, estuarine and coastal restoration. And that's really the ideal way that we want to kind of look towards restoring our estuaries and coasts uh, in the future. So, yeah, that's uh, all I have to say. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Ben. That was so interesting and great to hear about these resources that are now available. Um, so, I'll just uh, we'll kick off the QA section now. So, please do put your questions in the QA function at the bottom of your screen. Um, just, to, just to kind of kick things off, um, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned about biodiversity net gain being an opportunity in this space for restoration. Um, forgive me for my ignorance, but is there much in the area of guidance for marine net gain or coastal net gain? Uh, where biodiversity net gain will run down to the intertidal zone, so intertidal habitats will be will be covered by it, um, I believe. Uh, marine net gain is still in process at the moment, and still a lot of. Uh, as far as I understand, anyway, it's not something I'm directly involved with, but uh, there's a lot of thinking about how it will work. And but I think it's still very much in uh, in to be well. It's going to going to be going ahead at some stage. It's just there's a lot, a lot of thinking to uh, still to be done on how exactly it's going to be implemented. Great, thank you. Um, and then one other question is: um, you demonstrated in your in your presentation. Um, that the re restoration of salt marsh, for example, provides numerous ecosystem services, um, including for carbon sequestration, biodiversity. Um, so how do you think we can better connect the organisations working in this space? Um, for example, the UNF, C and the CDB, uh, CBD, sorry, um, so that they can kind of work together to support these multifunctional solutions? Um, there are, there are, I think there are some global initiatives for nature-based solutions. I think that the IUCN has recently published a kind of a global standard for nature-based solutions that um, should hopefully try and start bringing together some of these, uh, these kind of uh, more international uh, approaches uh, to try and kind of yeah, link, yeah, try and link them together a little bit more. I think I, I Ideally, we probably we do we probably need to have a, a bit more guidance on how to have a standard approaches and standard methods for some of these me measurements. We'll, we have there are standard approaches out there for blue carbon measurements, but some of these other ecosystem services we don't really again we're still lacking a lot of evidence about how much value trying to value uh, um, how much salt marsh can be for as a flood defence or how much salt marsh can be for nutrient remediation. And I think um, as, as we kind of develop these natural capital approaches, which seems to be very much more becoming the Coming uh, more prominent over the next uh, over the last few years and uh, into the future, I think we'll probably have to yeah work a lot more in partnership in order to have a standard approaches that can be applicable across these different schemes and initiatives. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here from a, a postgrad student um, looking to do a project in creating wetland. Um, and to create habitat around the effluent of the dairy industry. Just he, he was just they're just asking for any advice in this area or, or how you think you can get involved in these types of projects. Um, as a, I, 
so there are a lot of ngos out there who are very much interested i'm not, I'm not sure if you've been in contact with some of the, the big ones who undertake restoration work so the wildfowl and wetlands trust or um, the rspb who are very much in, in they are definitely the people to contact um in terms of being probably wanting to undertake a lot projects there i know the wildfowl and wetlands trust in particular have got a lot of phds and research uh, projects running in some of their sites um particularly like such as steer marshes as i mentioned earlier looking at the benefits of these habitats so they were probably a good good group to contact first to, uh, to, to yeah explore those opportunities great thank you um another question here asking could the seagrass handbook be used or adapted for use in other biogeographical regions um, such as the Poseidon's hair in the Mediterranean? Um, potentially. Uh, I think if it's looking about the Mediterranean, it's, Pos I think it's a Posidonia bed. So I think the Posidonia, they, they, they are quite different to the seagrass that we get in the UK in terms of how, and Posidonia is a, is a, is a potentially a huge, that, that is a real benefit of the carbon, the blue carbon habitat, Posidonia has got a huge potential for it because it's a much, much, uh, uh, highest carbon storage than our zostra beds. Um, I think that, that a lot of the same rules and the same approaches will, uh, are applicable. Um, I'm not sure if there is any approach out there for Bostonia already. There are, I know for other parts of the world, Australia and I think there's a United Nations West, Af West Africa um, seagrass restoration guides. There are a few others out there, um, I, but I think there's probably a few so the approaches are, are similar, I think, between the different habitats. Amazing, thank you. Um, another attendee is saying that they've read the Salt Marsh Handbook and it's a fantastic practical guide. Um, and they're working in a PhD where they need to identify sites with the greatest potential for salt marsh restoration in Scotland uh, with the aim of coastal adaptation, um, much like the restoration potential maps you've created for England. She's just wondering if there's a way of connecting with someone at the EA um, to learn about how these maps were created. Yeah, more than getting in contact with me, I've got, I help people create with the, the salt marsh one. Actually, we worked with the uh, marine management organization to create and uh, and ABP Mayor who we worked on the uh, the dredge sediment handbook. So they're, they're, they're using our environment agency flood zone maps as a basis. But um, I'm more than happy to go and explain some of the options and some of the things we've done with that with those maps. Um, so, yeah, contact me directly. Perfect. Thanks, Ben. Um, does the salt marsh handbook include information on how benefits for wildlife can be maximised? For example, some realignment schemes have low value, for example, for shorebirds, unless they feature, they have features like islands. Yeah, so we do, uh, we, there is, I believe, off the top of my, I remember there is a section in the handbook that specifically discusses how you can design your, your uh, project to benefit whether it be for flood defence or to benefit particular species, whether it be nursery fit, nursery sites for fish or for, um, and how to design your your drainage systems and creek networks to, to benefit fish, and then also for other uh, habitats as well for so what you need for for birds and for other other kind of um, species that want to use a marsh. So there is some uh, information in there about how how to do that. Great. Um... And with the use of dredged sediments in habitat restoration, does the handbook consider potential contaminants in sediments, for example, metals, which may be present and affect the system if placed on land? Yes, so uh, that's, the, the, in current, that's covered in the legislation section of it. So obviously there are, uh, there, we, well, there are formerly with the CFAS action levels um, that we use to assess the level of sediment in dredged material, whether that be a, a uh, if the level, if the level of contamination of heavy metals is too high, um, and there is a, there are new approaches that, uh, to replace the action levels coming in soon as well. Um, we yeah we do cover those. I think when we the handbook was published, we were between the two new approaches coming in. So I think the, the when it gets updated, it will probably include the new uh, the new guidance. But it, it's very much needs to be taken into account, and and it's kind of a different approach to or different legislation requirements compared to the salt marsh uh, creation for using dredge sediment. It's very much something you need to bear in mind. Not all dredge sediment is suitable for uh, restoration through that approach. Great point, thank you. Um, and does using the handbooks for restoration projects allow for organisations to formally offset greenhouse gases? For example, like applying the Woodland Code does for woodland restoration. No, they're not. A, they're not a carbon code. There are there are plans for a salt marsh carbon code, um, such as uh, similar to the peatland and the woodland codes that are already there, and that's something that uh, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology are currently exploring at the moment. Um, but our handbooks are not uh, equivalent to that. 
Thank you. Um, and a little bit related to this, I guess, then, is how do you see issues around ad additionality being managed in regard to restoration projects providing biodiversity net gain and carbon credits? Additionality is in uh, we, the benefits just get utilised repeatedly by um, other for different schemes. Uh, I guess I think they mean how would you, for example, measure measure the net, the net gain or or the amount of carbon that's being sequestered in these habitats? It, it is. I, I think. Well, I think we 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 still don't have a method for for that yet. I think the. Uh, I think that's still a lot of that still needs to be developed and needs to be thought through quite clearly. Uh, I mentioned some of the issues that we have around some of the variability within these habitats and with and the lack of the evidence base that we have for uh, for most of these habitats to really have confidence in uh, in that and especially. I think one of the, issue, uh, the issues I didn't mention is that we still need to really establish is a temporal change, particularly in restored salt marshes, because carbon can shoot up and down. Uh, there's evidence for carbon shooting up very, very quickly in restored marshes and then, and then can stop or drop off. So um, I, th <laughs> I think in terms of additional, we, there's a lot we still need to work out, basically. That makes sense. Um, and are there any tips on dealing with conflict of use? For example, yachters wanting to drop anchor in Sudden seagrass habitat. Yeah, uh, well, I, the seagrass restoration projects, I, well, I haven't been involved directly in seagrass restoration projects that the project seagrass have been doing, but I know they had similar issues when they were encountering their restoration projects in Wales, in Dale, um, that they had to take account of all the stakeholders and work with all the stakeholders that included areas, areas which were anchorages and uh, where moorings were to kind of design their seagrass restoration projects. So the, the communication section in the seagrass handbook does cover that in a bit more detail. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all we have time for in terms of questions today. Um, and thank you for your presentation, Ben. It was a really comprehensive overview of those um, restoration handbooks and, and restoration in general. So thank you for that. And I hope you enjoyed taking part. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. Um, great to see so many of you here today and asking loads of questions. Um, so I hope you found that beneficial and informative. Um, and don't forget to record your attendance at this webinar on the IES CPD tool. Um, the next webinar that the IS is holding is on the 8th of February and is on integrating air pollution, greenhouse gas and other uh, wider impact analysis into decision maker support tools. Um, and you can register for this on our website. Thanks once again to everyone for coming. Thank you. Goodbye.